Good morning, everyone. Today's discussion will be over chapter three of Animal Farm. Um, just to kind of quickly recap what occurred in chapter two, we have the belief system um, established called animalism. We also had the creation of the seven commandments. And then finally, we have the mystery of the disappearing milk. So that ought to catch us up and bring us into um, chapter three, which begins on page 45. So if you could get your PDF scrolled down to that page, that would be excellent. Um, and, and so here we are. Um, in chapter three, we open up with the harvest happening. Um, we know the animals worked extremely hard to get this done and they were successful with their hard work. In fact, it was actually better than what they had hoped for. Um, but with the event of the harvest, I wanted to focus on the animals who worked really hard physically to get this done and the animals that did not. Um, I wanna start off with the ones that didn't, um, some of those being the pigs. Um, notice that when they when it came to the harvest, they were the ones who decided they were going to oversee and supervise everybody else. Um, and they claimed that it's with their superior knowledge that they should be the leaders over everyone and just conduct the harvest themselves. So they're not wanting to put in the hard work. They don't want to get their hooves dirty. Um, so that's, that's one group of, of animals that didn't really help. Um, we also have animals such as like Molly who slacks off, you know, she has a hard time getting up in the mornings. She leaves early uh, from work when she feels that she's injured, even though we know that she probably isn't. We have the cat that seems to disappear whenever hard work seems to be needing to be done, um, but always manages to make it back whenever the food is served, you know, so wants to reap the benefits without actually doing anything. Um, so those were those, I guess, animals that kind of fell on the lazier, lazier end of the harvest. We also have animals that did do the work and put in the work. Um, one of those being Boxer. You know, he assumes the work of three horses and he always is the one that pushes and pulls in the hardest spot. So um, that's the one that really sticks out to me. Um, his motto continues to be, I will work harder with any setback. It's I will work harder. Um, and he even gets up earlier than everyone else to get work done. So we do have, on the other hand, animals that are, um, you know, active in the harvest. Um, we also have animals that really don't put in too much work and don't put in not enough work. That would be Benjamin, for instance. Um, actually, you know, speaking of Benjamin, I have a few things to say about him um, in terms of his opinions. So uh, everyone else kind of seems to blindly accept things. Benjamin, we know, has opinions, but he never manages to share them or never wants to share them. And when they do ask for his opinion, he only says something like this. Let me quote you. Uh, donkeys live a long time. None of you has ever seen a dead donkey. Uh, what do you think he means by this? This is a question I, I'm posing to you guys. What I believe he's trying to say is that keeping your opinions to yourself is how you survive. If you decide to voice your opinion and you stand up to authority, um, it could potentially get you killed. You know, Benjamin, again, is a smart animal. Um, and I believe he, he is aware of, uh, of that fact that this could potentially happen to him. Um, the only problem with that is, you know, he is educated enough and smart enough to stand up to injustice, but he is not willing to do so, and that lets them run without any opposition, and I think that's a dangerous thing. Um, just keep that in mind for a later time. Um, going forward, we have a couple of animals that are in constant state of disagreement throughout the course of this chapter, and even in chapters that follow. Um, those animals are Napoleon and Snowball, two of the pigs. And, uh, you know, they disagree about everything. It doesn't matter what it is. Even if there is something that they both could agree on, they decide to go pick apart smaller details and then argue about those. And the reason why they do this is because they're both fighting for that ultimate leadership position. They want to be the one person in charge or the one animal in charge. And, uh, you know, and this is their struggle to get that. To get that. Um, to connect this historically, they actually represent uh, Trotsky and Stalin. You know, this is why I had you guys review some of that that history and that um, that handout in the PowerPoint. Um, so going back, we've got Trotsky and Stalin. Um, they had a fierce rivalry with each other um, for the leadership position after the death of Lenin. So. You know, Lenin in, in our book's case would be Old Major. So after Old Major's death, we have Snowball and Napoleon fighting to become the new leader. So there is that that historical connection, okay? 
Um, moving on, we do have the pigs attempting to educate the others, but we see that this is not successful. Uh, actually, what this does is it results in an imbalance in knowledge, uh, and you know, with that imbalance comes a lot of negative consequences. You know, the pigs are the only ones that seem to be able to read and write perfectly. We can assume Benjamin can, but he's not willing to share anything. Um, everyone else struggles, has no idea what's going on. Um, Boxer being one of the, one of those um, animals. My question to you, and I want you to think about, is do you see this happening in our own society, and how um, how what kinds of consequences can occur from that, and you know, negative consequences. Um, we also have the pigs simplifying the principles. Remember the seven commandments that were established? Now they've kind of shortened it down to just one that they need to really know. Four legs good, two legs bad. Um, do you believe that this is an oversimplification? Um, I think so, because over time, obviously, animals will forget the rest of the commandments. And I find that this is just very convenient for um, animals such as the pigs. I think it would serve them very well because if the other animals forget the commandments, the, the rest of them, then it allows the pigs to break those commandments without the animals recognizing it. Um, I also think that, you know, it's oversimplification because four legs good, two legs bad. That doesn't just automatically make all four legs good. Like, you know, um, four legs, any animals that, that sit on four legs could be bad as well. But uh, of course, you know, notice that even though um, everyone doesn't understand Snowball's exp explanation for the simplification. They just accept it. Um, you know, in fact, the sheep are the ones that keep bleeding this commandment over and over and over again. You know, so um, kind of fitting that it'd be the sheep. You know, we refer to blind masses as sheep as well. So, um, and, you know, people keep spewing out uh, things without really understanding what they're saying. So just keep that in mind. Um, we also solve the mystery of the milk in this chapter, okay? Um, what we find out is that the milk is going to be uh, mixed into the pig's mash. Uh, so they're going to eat that. Um, so they, they reap the benefits of the milk, which is something that everybody likes. They also lay claim to the apples, another luxury. Um, why is this significant? Well, it's significant because we already can see that they're not treating the animals equally and they are already corrupt. Uh, you know, these are subtle abuses of power. Um, this is what allows, you know, the pigs to get away with things. If you do just a little bit of a time, you break little rules, um, you know, then it, it's not quite as obvious and, and they just get away with it. So, um, so, you know, they're not equal. That was one of the commandments of, uh, that they established in the beginning. All animals are equal. Well, not really the case here. Um, shifting forward, I also want to talk to you a little bit about propaganda. Normally in class, we would probably examine this in greater detail, but uh, just for the sake of this video lesson, I want to just define what propaganda is and then connect it to what's happening in this chapter. So propaganda by definition would be the information which is especially of a biased and sort of uh, misleading nature that is used to uh, promote or publicize a particular belief or political belief or point of view, okay? So, um, you know, how does this connect with this chapter? Well, we've got uh, Squealer's speech being a perfect example of propaganda. You know, his speech is used to convince the animals that the pigs need the milk and need the apples um, because they're the brains behind this operation on the farm. And he uses a variety of persuasive techniques in order to uh, deliver his speech. Let me read some of these examples off to you. First off, he uses repetition. Um, one of the phrases that I, I heard constantly was, do you want to see Jones come back? Do you want to see Jones come back? Do you want to see Jones come back? Um, so hearing that all the time also would lead to the next technique, which I'm establishing here is, is fear. Okay. Um, they remember what the conditions were like when Jones was running the farm and it was terrible. They didn't, they don't want to return back to that. So fear of that allows them to, uh, to believe that it's okay that the pigs take the mash and take the apples and, and it's not a big deal. Okay. Another thing that he, he does, one of the persuasive techniques he uses is, camaraderie. You know, he refers to the animals as comrades. Remember I said that that term was going to be significant in the rest of the play. Um, what it does is it makes them feel like they're all together in this, that they're all friends, that they are in the same uh, position in life, which we know is not really the case because the pigs are the ones that are um, up in here. They're the, the leaders. 
okay? So, um, so that addressing of, of the animals is significant. And then finally, the rhetorical questions. Um, let, me, let me give you an example of this. It says, you do not imagine, I hope, that we pigs are doing this in a spirit of selfishness and privilege. Really? Um, okay, so those are just some examples of, of, you know, how he manages to convince everybody that this is the right thing. Um, I also wanted to discuss the fact that Squealer is selective with his information and sometimes he tells out outright lies when addressing the animals. For example, we've got many of us dislike milk and apples. Our sole subject in taking these things is to preserve our health. Really? And then finally, day and night, we're watching over your welfare. So, um, you know, we can see through these outright lies but unfortunately for the animals, they do not. Because it is said that it was accepted without argument that the pigs should have the milk and apples. So they're so easily manipulated into believing this and they follow them blindly. And that's going to lead to a lot more unfortunate consequences. So that's the end of chapter three. Hopefully this helps you guys out. And of course, as always, you can email me with any questions or on Fridays we can Zoom and you can address them there, okay? Uh, have a good one. See you later.